You're listening to Hear Arizona. Addressing issues, empowering our community. What's often called our food system, the way we produce and distribute food, is intimately linked with the environment and climate change. If you want to talk about those things, you kind of have to talk about food. First of all, it's responsible for 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of that comes from the burps of millions of cows and chemical fertilizers that give off nitrous oxide. And in the Western U.S., agriculture uses 80% of the dwindling water supply, growing a lot of very thirsty crops like alfalfa to feed cows. In all three parts of our recent water series, we heard from farmers. The one thing is we got to be more proficient with our water and we need to find more of it. The long and short of it is, and you guys can argue the numbers, we're pulling out more, more water out of our aquifer than we're putting back in. So farmers feel the effects of water shortages much sooner and more severely than the rest of us. I go to bed every night and I wake up every day going, what the hell are we doing? Are we going to be able to do this anymore? So what are we doing when it comes to food? Can we be doing a better job? As we've learned, the industrial food system that dominates America today is not very old, fewer than 100 years. For thousands of years before corn syrup became ubiquitous and Tyson had airplane hangar-sized chicken coops, indigenous people across the United States and beyond developed extremely successful methods of growing food and surviving on this land. They're true experts on living and growing food here. What is sustainability, if not coming up with a system that lasts for thousands of years? So now, as we face climate crisis and water shortage, people are looking back to these old systems for new insights. They're looking to people like Sterling Johnson, a Thana Otham farmer in Ajo we heard from in our last episode. Uh, All of this was done naturally. It wasn't done with any uh, lotions or potions. It was all Mm. done with um, crop rotations, um, organic compost. Your soil, you want it to be like a sponge. You know, you can see it's all nice, dark and brown, and Mm -hmm. you know the soil really uh, soaks up a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Uh, And imagine if we could replicate that on a larger scale. One challenge, though, with looking back to the time-tested wisdom of America's indigenous people, is that it was aggressively suppressed for so long the American government forcibly removed native people from their homelands and burned their farmlands they'd cultivated for centuries. And they forcibly sent native children to boarding schools where they were made to forget their culture and the traditional knowledge of the land that came with it. My family members had to do what they can to not live in this this modern society. And that meant dropping a lot of things that made us who we are now. Now I'm rediscovering those things and I'm sharing those things. On this episode, a conversation with someone who straddles two worlds, the millennia old indigenous one that holds the wisdom of living sustainably and the newer Western one that holds the power of mainstream culture and economics. And that straddling is important because if we want to implement some lessons from the tried and true way of living with the land, those two worlds need to come together. That Western world, America's government, industry, and academic institutions, was for a long time dismissive and even hostile toward Native American knowledge. It wasn't considered enlightened, rational, or scientific. But now, that's starting to change. Now it sounds like we're starting to turn around because there's this big interest in Indian agriculture, this big interest in traditional ecological knowledge. That's a big thing. That's a real big thing. And uh, I really like our practices because, you know, they've been time tested. You know, we have over sometimes 10,000 years of replication. You know, we just do things a little differently. From here, Arizona, this is Inhospitable. I'm Anthony Wallace. A 
I first spoke with Michael Kotetua Johnson over Zoom a few months ago when I was in Phoenix and he was at his home on the Hopi Reservation in northern Arizona. So if you can imagine, you know, we've been in the same location for 3,000 years, right? And so, you know, we've developed all these techniques that uh, conserve soil moisture. You know, He's a farmer growing famous Hopi heirloom multicolored corn with no irrigation whatsoever, using traditional dryland farming techniques. And our conversation made a big impression on me. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's one of the few places in the, in the United States where uh, we raise corn to fit the environment and do not manipulate the environment to fit the corn. Okay, that's- He's also an accomplished researcher. He attended Cornell and got a PhD in natural resource management from the University of Arizona. One study he did found that even though native farmers oversee 6% of the United States' farmland, they only received 2% of the farming funding contracts from two of the federal government's big conservation agencies. You'd think they'd get more being longtime experts of sustainability. But Michael told me that a big part of the problem comes from a disconnect between traditional indigenous knowledge and the scientific knowledge that comes out of universities. The thing that's hard for me to understand is there's conservation programs out there and they don't, um, we can't receive funding right now because our, our practices have not been scientifically validated. You know, we have, yet we have 3,000 years of replication, but, uh, you know, they want scientific validation behind those. So Michael's life has largely been about bringing these two sides together to make a better food system that would benefit our health, economy, and environment. You know, one of the main things that I'm calling for right now is this, is this restoration of the American Indian food system. Out of that, beautiful things can happen. And, uh, and it's not just for Indian people, but it's for everybody. And so uh, my, my thing is here is to build a bridge. You know, it's to build a bridge. It's not to, to destroy one. And so... I was really interested in Michael's far-ranging experience and this bridge that he's building. But as always, it was a little tough to talk over Zoom and the audio quality wasn't great. So when he told me he was coming to town to speak at the Arizona Food Summit at Arizona State University, I jumped at the chance to meet and record him in person. We met at the Ten Across headquarters in Tempe. This will definitely sound better. Um, But yeah, thanks again for like bearing with the uh, technical difficulties. Hey, no problem, buddy. Anytime I could do this, this is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy to be here. And so now you got the whole setup, no no Zoom stuff or, you know, you should get a good recording. Okay, yeah, my name is uh, Michael Kotetua Johnson. I'm a newly hired um, extension specialist at the University of Arizona, and I'll be housed in the... Um, in the School of Natural Resources in the Environment. A lot of this work, of course, is going to be promoting uh, the University of Arizona's Indigenous Resiliency Center, which is something new that will not only tackle food issues, but energy issues, um, issues of intellectual property, you know, all types of policy issues. But will you continue to live uh, where you have been on Hopi Reservation? I'll probably go back and forth. Um, it's, it's an extension position, so I'll be able to, because I'm working with tribes, you know, there's, there's at least, there's a number of tribes up, up north that will allow me to be up there. Um, I've been also building a beautiful sandstone house up on the Hopi Reservation that overlooks my, my about 11 acres of fields down there, and I'm able to uh, bring other groups up there to kind of have a cultural experience and then have my own people come up and learn things too, so it's a beautiful thing. That sounds good, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like your life, your early early years. Where did you grow up? You know, I I grew up with my with my parents. Um, uh, a lot of spent a lot of time on military military installations. My dad was a, a full colonel in the army, and I spent a lot of time moving around different parts of the United States, Hawaii, New York, Oklahoma, places like that. Uh, and then when my dad left the military, he settled in Winslow, Arizona, to be a, a minister at a Presbyterian church there. And uh, it was during that time, about at age 10, my father started taking me out here to the reservations, which is about 70 miles away, the Hopi Reservation. And I got to spend time with my grandfather, and I got to go out and farm. Um, and I think that was 
that was as a 10 year old kid, you really don't think much about that because at, on the reservation at the time, we had one TV channel and I'd be woken up at six in the morning going out there and farming. And one time I told my grandfather that I was bored and he and he brought me brought me up at five in the morning the next day and I was out there hoeing more weeds and things like that. So I never said I'm bored again. At 10 years old with your, your grandfather in the field, initially saying you're bored, how did you... How was that experience learning from him? Like, how did it kind of grow on you uh, over time? Well, I think, you know, when I was a when I was a kid, he was, you know, I, I, I didn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. But then he sat me down and says, you're doing this because this is who we are as Hopi. You know, we've been farmers f- since time immemorial. And it's so um, this is what you're supposed to do. You know, um, and so once I got that into my little brain there, I said, this is this is this is OK, you know, uh, because farming is is it's I would call it what they would call a faith based agriculture, uh, you know, approach to things. You know, our, our faith is not separated from our agriculture uh, experience. And so they both work uh, simultaneously together to to allow us to survive in such a hard place where we only get six to ten inches of annual rainfall a year and to actually grow corn, beans, melons and squash with no irrigation. Can you imagine that? I mean, when I tell the farmers in North Carolina that I plant my corn down anywhere from six to 18 inches, they kind of freak out because they say, how can it come up from that depth? And I say, well, you gotta have faith, man. <laughs> right, and so it does. And so it's kind of it's kind of neat to, to look at their expressions and, um, and just, and I explain to them why we do what we do because I think in life, in my opinion, in life, we need to figure out um, the reasons why we do things so much, and that takes slowing down a little bit, you know. And uh, because once we understand that, then it becomes a lot more—I um, wouldn't call it palatable, but a lot more enjoyable. Yeah. So you kind of found like sounds like a sense of purpose. A sense of purpose, exactly. And I think you know that's what's missing uh, a lot of times and to me in America is that we just. We don't take the time to figure out who we are, you know, and why we're doing what we're doing. We're in such a fast, uh, rushed pace to get someplace that if we just allow us to slow down just a little bit, then I think we could see things a little bit more clearly. We now ask that you please turn and face the flag as we honor America with the singing of our national anthem by Michael Johnson. Then I went to the university. I went to Arizona State University School of Music as, as a, after I got done with high school as a vocal major. A vocal major. I'm classically trained to sing opera songs. Oh. A lot of people don't know that, but that's what I do. Whose broad stripes and bright stars. So you know, I still perform once in a while. Um, it's just a lot of fun for me. It's my. It's one of my passions. One of my many passions. And then I got really frustrated because I couldn't pass this one particular class, and so I wound up dropping out. I went to went home, and I was farming again. And then, uh, three years later, somebody came out and asked me, "What? How come I dropped out of school?" And I told them. And then um, they sent me. Uh, they asked if I wanted to go Cornell University back east in agriculture, and I said, "Yeah, I'll do that." Yeah. So you uh, acquired, you know, years of experience with your grandfather uh, farming, and then you went to Cornell to mm-hmm. study. Agriculture. agriculture. Mm-hmm. So, what was it like to bring that knowledge into this Ivy League institution? <laughs> it was very challenging to say the least. You know, I had, you know, I was kind of a, a what they call an anomaly, an outlier there. You know, I was talking, you know, I had classes in agronomy, soil science, crop science, and to talk about how we, how our crop systems uh, utilize and how we're able to, how we manage it was kind of had a little bit of a a lot of questions on that, you know. They're like, "Well, how can you? How can your corn come up from that deep? You know, how how how, how come you spread your corn so far apart? You know, we got like three paces between each of our clumps of corn. You know, one of my friends called me the bush master because because my because my corn comes up looks like a bush, but uh, it's just kind of funny like that. But you know, it was just it was a very a very um, proving process, I think, you know, for me being a traditional agriculturalist um, with all this, with all these years of knowledge, trying to try to go through this Western way of doing things was very difficult because, you know, it seems to me that, you know, the Western approaches of doing things are very uh, siloed and they're very territorial. 
And so when you do something that's different, that makes no sense to them, they don't understand how to deal with that, right? And so it was kind of a challenge. But, you know, overall, when my, my years that I spent there, just the three years that I was there, uh, I got to change a lot of opinions, you know. But the education that I got proved to be invaluable because it was an Ivy League institution. It did open up a lot of doors for me, and I wouldn't trade any of that education I've got for the world right now. It sounds like it was a, a two-way thing. You were teaching them, mm-hmm. they were teaching you. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, I'm, we're still teaching, you know. Since 1492, we're still teaching. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's kind, of, it's kind of funny like that, but yeah. Michael told me that when he was at Cornell, they taught him that it takes 33 inches of annual rainfall to grow corn. That was the official scientific knowledge at the time. But he knew it was wrong. Farming on the Hopi Reservation, the way that his grandfather and dozens of generations of Hopi farmers before him did, They grew corn with just 6 to 10 inches of annual rainfall. So he taught them, a world-leading Ivy League institution, about a more water-efficient way to grow corn. After Cornell, Michael went on to work for First Nations Development Institute and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. He got a master's from Pepperdine University and a PhD from the University of Arizona. Wherever he goes, he is a promoter of indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, or as it's sometimes abbreviated, iTech. It's all about getting more people on board with iTech. And to me, it seems like there are some pretty good arguments for it. Yeah, it seems like a lot of it comes down to like a culture shift. Yep. And people changing how they think. Mm -hmm. And like just having a lot of respect Mm -hmm. for traditional ecological knowledge yep and to me it seems like it's pretty easy because it's just like something that has survived for so long mm-hmm. that's all that i need to know yep personally yep the proof is in the pudding yeah yep. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's time time tested there's no better there's no yeah. better it works you can't you test it anymore you know uh, there's a reason like i said you know indigenous people uh, hold on to 80 percent of the biodiversity on 25 percent of the land with only five percent of the population there's a reason for that right because it works <laughs> so how many times are we going to have to invent a new wheel and, and, and then try to run with it again and to watch it fail you know why not why not just hold on to something and move with it mm-hmm. an old wheel that, exactly that an old wheel. has worked for a long time exactly <laughs> And that, bio, that that statistic is that way. It's not because the Indian reservations in the U.S. or wherever across the world, wherever Native people live, it's not because they happen to live where there's more biodiversity. It's because the biodiversity has survived. It survived because it's it, it was it's a unique um, human um, environmental relationship. It's one of reciprocation and not taking. And so uh, that, that's why it's that's why it works out well. You know, they're still gathering their food there. They're still harvesting things, but it's not done in such a way where it's very exploitive. You know, because if you were to do that, then what would you eat? What would you build? You know, and we talk about you know the, all the wildfires that are going on. We have ways to address those. You know, a lot of those are many prescribed burns. You know, for a long time. Uh, the environmentalists were against that type of thing. You know, they were against thinning out forests. But if you look at how the Indian people have done it, it's beautiful. You know, not only have pine trees in there, you have oak trees in there, you have pinyon trees in there. You I mean you have a diversity, a whole bunch of biodiversity that supports each other. You know, and then you have the people coming in there, for example, uh, gathering acorn nuts. You know, and clearing ways so that so that more stuff can grow. And so it's a well balanced system. You know, it's just that. Um, we don't take enough time to look at those type of systems and say, yeah, this is good for us, you know? Um, and so, but there's a lot changing, the political landscape's changing, and so we'll just see where it goes. Yeah, it, but it, it comes down to a different uh, A different approach to things, yep, a different way to look at things, mm-hmm. you know? The land is to be respected as like a partner or something, mm-hmm. as opposed to like just a surface to yep. live on. Yep. Yep, that's what I always say. I say hope is one of the few places that I know that corn is raised to fit the environment and the environment is not manipulated to fit the corn. And that's kind of, kind of gets at the heart of... That's what it does. It does. It gets at the heart of the thing. Yeah. 
Michael had mentioned this statistic to me the last time we talked, and at first I didn't quite know how to interpret it. But the more I thought about it, the more it started to make sense. An indigenous people is a group whose history and culture is linked to the earliest known inhabitants of their geographical region. They're simply very long time residents of their particular plot of earth. Indigenous people across the world represent just 5% of the population, but they inhabit 25% of the land and protect 80% of the planet's biodiversity. That's not just because indigenous people happen to live in the most biologically vibrant and diverse parts of the world. It's because all of the vibrant and diverse plants and animals that have always lived with them have continued to survive and thrive alongside them. Because indigenous people know their place and know how to maintain its vitality. Meanwhile, places where people have more recently moved into have not fared nearly as well. Much of the life there has been plowed or paved over. The animals died out or forced away. We've seen this phenomenon play out in smaller ways in other episodes of Inhospitable. In episode one, we learned how people that rent houses short term are less likely to plant trees. In episode four, we covered a massive dairy operation that moved into the southern Arizona Valley and quickly started sucking water out of the ground much more quickly than nature could replace it. It represents two fundamentally different ways of seeing the natural environment we live in. On one hand, there's a long-term home we want to keep healthy and keep sustaining itself naturally. On the other, a short-term piece of real estate we can use up and move on from when it's spent. It seems to me that that latter perspective has driven a lot of the environmental destruction and problems we worry about today. Embracing indigenous traditional ecological knowledge represents a deep philosophical shift to seeing ourselves as more long-term residents, as more of an integrated part of the environment, as opposed to masters over it. And that is a big shift, especially when the government and institutions like Ivy League schools have not always been so kind to the indigenous perspective. But Michael sees reason for optimism. Last year, the federal government put out a memo stating that iTech should be a central part of federal environmental policy, and it included a few examples of how that's already happening. Wabanaki tribes in Maine are working with the National Park Service on research into their ancient method of harvesting sweetgrass. Members of the Cowlitz Indian tribe in Washington are working with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to map historical distributions of a threatened species of fish based on oral tradition. That's a big thing. That's a real big thing. And uh, for the longest time, I've been telling people that, you know, uh, that our that our practices are just as valid as anything that you're producing as far as conservation wise. But now it's actually getting solidified. You know, and so I'm happy about that. But there's still a lot of work to get done in that area. Yeah. You know, like back in the 50s, uh, at Hopi at least, we were able to raise our own food. We were pretty much really independent. But then now, recently in the last COVID thing, I saw four-hour lines just to get a box of food. You know, and uh, you know, and I appreciate organizations like St. Mary's Food Bank and some of the ones that are here organizing in Arizona to help us because we really needed to help, you know. And to me, that's... It's good, but it kind of shows a big reflection on our society. How come we're not really sustainable like we used to be? Why are we buying all this? So it was kind of a, a little cultural shock to my own people. So I'm hoping to take that and say we need to do more farming, you know? I mean, it, it, to me, it's not really about um, the whole idea about farming. Is To me, it's not about having a crop every year, but it's about building yourself internally, you know, becoming a, 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 a better human being, so to speak. You know, it's that part of it. In my recent episode, I looked at kind of the history of agriculture in the U.S. And mm -hmm. it's it's basically a story of less farms every year and each farm being bigger. Do you think that that could be reversed? I think it could be, but it just takes a lot of it takes a lot of the consumer to move the needle. You know, it takes a lot of people to say, hey, I don't want to buy from these industrial giants. I want to buy from the local farmer. In this world, the way we work, it's all about supply and demand. That's the number one economic principle, supply and demand. When iTech is applied to food production, it often looks like regenerative agriculture. That's the kind of farming Michael does and the kind of farming we heard about from Sterling Johnson and Ajo in our last episode. Michael calls the kind of mainstream industrial agriculture that has dominated America's food system in recent decades a market-based system. That's because it's built around maximizing profit. 
And you do that by growing as much food as efficiently as possible. And you still profit even if you damage the environment or people's health in the process. Using a bunch of pesticides to grow tons and tons of genetically modified corn or hay for cows to eat might be damaging to the soil. It might emit serious amounts of greenhouse gases, and it might make nothing but sugary processed snacks and dairy products. But it is profitable. It feeds a well-oiled machine of an industry that's been churning out this stuff for decades. Regenerative agriculture, on the other hand, uses crop rotation, grows a huge variety of vegetables, and fertilizes the soil with manure from goats and chickens and pigs that live on the farm. According to one recent study, it can produce vegetables that are more nutrient dense than organic produce you find in the grocery store. But it doesn't have that well-oiled machine of an industry to support it. And that brings us back to supply and demand. Michael stresses the importance of building up the supply and demand for native regenerative agriculture. And it's easy to see how and why people would demand the healthier and more sustainable food it creates. So he supports an effort by the Intertribal Agriculture Council to develop an official regenation seal that would go on iTech produced food like the organic symbol. There's the whole organic approaches to things, you know, there's the whole new regenerative agricultural movement that's been out there for the last 10 years. But we're always forgotten, you know, we don't have the, we, we, the people don't realize that, you know, we're the ones who basically invented regenerative agriculture because we've been doing that in our holistic management practice since time immemorial, right? And so what that would do, it would, it would say, well, these products are all um, the cattle, the food, everything's done uh, in an environmental friendly manner using your own, using indigenous uh, conservation techniques. It's almost like you have to have two different types of agriculture. You have to have like the, the, the commodity type agriculture you'll see like in Iowa, and then Indian agriculture. So what's the difference? Who do you want to buy from? Because the big movement right now is to push to buy products by the supply chain people to buy environmentally friendly sound products, right? That's a huge market. So why not, why not label something Indian? And then there is the supply side of the equation. The only problem with regenerative agriculture is that there's really no financial mechanism really set up right to move those people away from conventional farming to regenerative farming. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a big problem uh, because the farmer right now is struggling enough. So it's, it's, very tough, it's very tough on the American farmer to actually, you know, get out of that conventional thing and then move into a regenerative thing. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have enough infrastructure and enough uh, capital investment in Indian country to have that supply all the time. To help with this problem, he told me about a 10-year, $3.4 billion plan from the Native American Agricultural Fund, which would support Native farmers with processing, packaging, and distribution infrastructure. But that is just a plan. Right now, it doesn't have funding. He said that funding could come from the private sector, nonprofit organizations, or the federal government. That's the investment, but you think about that, over 10 years, that's hardly anything. You know, it's nothing, you know, um, and, uh, but it's just a matter of changing the hearts and minds of people to actually do that. But I think people really have to understand, though, initially, the first thing we need to do is feed our own people, you know, make ourselves healthy, and then we can feed the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a crazy vision, but I can see it like that. <laughs> you are optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Michael says his goal is not just to revitalize the American Indian food system, but also to show people why it's necessary, mm -hmm. uh, because it wouldn't be necessary if we had not been relocated, you know, or, or removed, you know, or things like that. But it's necessary because we have the, the numbers that we have as far as Indian people, as far as diabetic rates, heart conditions are off the charts. Mm -hmm. The Bureau of Labor Statistics that recently reported that there was a, during the COVID crisis, there was, it, was 20, it was a 28% unemployment rate on the reservations. And so uh, that's one of the reasons. So infrastructure, agriculture infrastructure, things like processing centers, uh, food hubs, would bring some of that economic opportunities to the reservation. Just like Sterling, the Thana Otham farmer with the apprentices in our last episode, Michael hopes that creating more farmers on the reservation would improve health, independence, and economic opportunity among the American Indian population. Everyone can reap the benefits of iTech, but what Michael and others stress is that it cannot be exploitive. The Western world cannot simply take this native knowledge. It should be collaborative. 
this whole traditional ecological knowledge movement, in some ways, I feel like it's almost unexploitive. It's the new mineral industry here that might be coming up. It's a beautiful thing, but we got to be very careful about how that data is managed, you know, because if we don't do that, then it does become the new mineral industry. You know, are we going to benefit from sharing like that? You know, Native people traditionally have always shared everything. You know, if you look at the founding of this country, we were always willing to share everything. Um, and as a, but as a result, you know, we out of these federal policies, we got confined to Indian reservations and our, had our territory shrunken. Um, but there's ways to um, help mitigate that. Instead, he'd like to see Native farmers supported and empowered to use their unique, sustainable methods wherever they live. Traditional ecological knowledge, in a lot of cases, cannot be spread. You cannot take Hopi and Hopi knowledge and take it to Iowa and expect to have the same results because it's place-based. Traditional ecological knowledge is place-based. That's the number one thing. So use incubator models. What, what I would call an incubator model is where you, your end goal is to give it back to the person you're giving it to and let, them, let that person run it. You know, and I think that's what would have to be done is that, okay, we're going we're gonna to invest this much infrastructure in the tribe knowing that the tribe is going to take it over but we're not just going to just put it there and then leave. We're going to show those people how to run it right, you know, how to run it like a business. Unfortunately, the history of our country is we'll go out there and do mine exploration. We'll run the mine. They'll run the mine. The tribe won't have really much to do with it. Then you leave after you've exhausted all your natural resources, and that's not fair either. Yeah. And so there's those, those type of comparisons. But I think, you know, if we have these, use these incubator models, I think it's a good way to go. They use them a lot in South Africa within populations down there, and they seem to work pretty well. It's kind of like what Sterling's doing with the apprentices. Exactly, yeah. So, so it's, it's kind of like you could go to an Indian reservation, build a mine, take whatever you want out of the ground, mm -hmm. leave it when it, that stuff's gone, and that land is now less valuable and it will never recover never recover or you can invest in people there and you know use their own knowledge too to jump start some of this agriculture that has been done for so long yeah. in that area that mm -hmm. has proven to be sustainable yeah. and then it's a much longer term success yes it sure is and not only do the indians themselves benefit but the non-indians by getting up there and looking at that you know how many times i've had people ask me do i need a passport to go into an indian reservation i kind of look at it, where did that come from you know i mean uh, it just makes me smile i'm like indian country is not a bad place guys it's a beautiful place you know our like, god we sit on so much biodiversity out there, it's still pristine in a lot of areas. Come and visit. Ultimately, though, more indigenous farming across our country would not just mean a different way to look at nature and better conditions on Indian reservations. It would also mean better food. Is it uh, maybe an oversimplification, but you could think of it as the market-based Western conventional farming and traditional indigenous farming, it's kind of like quality versus quantity. Yeah. How do you describe the difference between the corn that you grow and whatever maybe is grown in Iowa just by the square mile or whatever? The quality, it's, it's nothing more than the quality. I mean, if you look at, um, there's been a few studies on indigenous corn um, and the, the mineral content, the vitamin content is is 10 times greater than what you would be eating at the supermarket because uh, it's not water-based, you know, especially Hopi corn, it's not water-based. And so you're basically eating what's all the minerals and stuff that's natural, you know? Yeah, maybe most people probably don't think about it, just think about, well, corn's corn. But there can be a, a yeah, world of difference between corn. It is. You know, and, and talking about corn, you know, at Hopi, we, cons we, we consider the corn our mother, you know. And so that's a whole different approach, too. It's the spiritual side, the, the, the um, ceremonial side, the, the, the value side. That's why we're able to raise things in a, in a barren environment. And that's why it's important, because not only are we uh, planting corn, but like I said, we're, we're, we're also looking at why we're planting what, what, what we're doing, you know, and it makes a healthy society, you know, and so, yeah. Yeah, so, like, when it comes to that why and the purpose question, um, 
It's so like on one hand, the market side, you have the purposes to to make money or feed a, a very just giant industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but the traditional side, it's... It's a community. You're feeding the community. You're not feeding the corporation. You're feeding the community. you so much for listening and to be sure you don't miss our future episodes subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen if this episode sparked your curiosity or inspired you to take action yourself you can find more information on the organizations we profiled and the issues they face on our website herearizona.org that's h-e-a-r arizona there you can also find our other podcast series on the most pressing challenges our state faces like homelessness, aging, and funding for the arts. One of the best ways to support our community-based solutions journalism is to tell your friends about it. They can search for Hear Arizona on their favorite podcast listening app, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, Spotify. And since we're all about empowering our community, we want you to be a part of the conversation. Follow Hear Arizona on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. This series is in part supported by Intel, committed to creating a more responsible, inclusive, and sustainable future for Arizona. Intel.com slash Arizona. This podcast series is made possible by grants from the Nina Mason Polium Charitable Trust and the Arizona Community Foundation. Here Arizona is a production of the Division of Public Service at Rio Salado College, which includes Sun Sounds, Spot 127, KBOC, and KJZZ. This episode was reported, written, scored, and hosted by me, Anthony Wallace. It was edited by KJZZ's Carrie Fair Snyder. Linda Pastore is our executive producer.